Good evening. Welcome. My name is Stephanie Mayuri, and I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance for Early Childhood. We are so excited to welcome you tonight to our pandemic parenting series, Creating Cozy Connections at Home. So we are thrilled to be serving you. Hopefully you're comfortable um, and um, we are ready to support you. It's a crazy time right now. Raising little ones is hard enough and then you add a pandemic on top of it and we know that presents many challenges and we are here to support you at the Alliance. We are a collaborative community organization that supports the healthy growth and development of children from birth to age eight. We've been around for over 30 years and we have over 60 member schools and organizations on the North Shore. And so if you're joining us for the first time tonight, welcome. If you've been to our programs before, we're glad to have you back and we are really happy to serve you at home. Um, we are going to be hosting tonight, Molly Pope. She's our local expert. She's facilitating all of our programming this year for parents and educators. She's a psychologist with many years of experience but also an infant early childhood mental health consultant. And she'll talk a little bit more about um, her experiences and what she brings to the table. But we really feel like right now, mental health is such a priority and we are eager to support that um, and you. So without further ado, um, I would like to welcome Molly. Hi, Molly. Thanks for being here. Um, before I hand it off to you, um, I just want to thank our gold sponsors who help make our program free and open to the public. Um, we are a nonprofit, so we really um, depend on um, the, the support from all these businesses in our community. Um, the first is Nutrier Township, Northwestern Center for Talent Development, um, Winneka Community Nursery School, FAN, Wilmette Optimist Club, Gainsburg Law, Kenilworth United Fund, Winneka Public Schools District 36, and Winneka Park District. So we are grateful to everyone's support that I just mentioned and um, grateful for you, Molly. So um, thanks for being here. Um, once again, I'm here if you need me. And um, go ahead, take it away. Should I share my screen? Yeah, go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, the Alliance is an amazing, uh, organization. Oops, I just I did the wrong thing. It's talking and trying to do the same thing. Okay. Um, so grateful for the Alliance. Uh, and I'm grateful to be here tonight with you all. Welcome. Thank you for um, coming and taking some time out of life. Uh, I hope that this is meaningful to you, um, that you have something you can take away and something you can implement by the end of this. So, um, just introduce myself. Stephanie did a little bit. My name is Molly Pope. Uh, I have over 17 years been working with children and families in classrooms. Much of that time was as a school psychologist in an early childhood and early elementary school. Um, and then more recently, I shifted my focus and my training to become an infant and early childhood mental health consultant. And in that role, I support preschools and daycares and the adults and children that are under those roofs um, through a relationship lens. I'm also a parent coach and I work with parents one-on-one, -on -one, problem solving together with them so they can face the challenges under their roof um, with confidence, ease, and grace. And then I'm also a teacher at Winnetka Public School Nursery in their Young Twos classroom. Uh, Winnetka Public School Nursery, or as I call it WPSN, um, is a Reggio Emilia inspired preschool. And if you don't know those words that I just said, I invite you to look them up at WPSN.org and learn more about us. Um, so that picture there, that's my family because that's my other role is I'm a mom of two boys and a wife. I am an animal lover. Outside these doors of my office are my cats waiting to come in and rub against my feet. Um, I'm a baker. I try to exercise. I love spin class. And I am a late to life surfer. I started learning to surf at 37 and it's something that I really love to do. So let's check in with you. Here you are, and you are in the right place if any of these apply to you. 
maybe feeling dread thinking about the coming months of cold weather, or you're exhausted and or bored by your current routines. You might feel guilty about how you're parenting right now, feeling like you're not enough. Or you know you need a plan for the next few months as the weather gets cold, but you're not sure where to start. Or you just need some ideas for activities to do with your family. So hopefully tonight, um, you will hit upon those things and you will get what you need. Because we all know um, we don't want to turn into Jack Nicholson, have a shining moment. What could possibly go wrong, right? So tonight I want to invite us to be in a creative problem solving mindset so that you can think about making a plan that will support your family's well-being, that will strengthen connection with your children, and that will foster cooperation. So whether you have young children, whether you hop down here and you have teenagers, all of these things still apply from zero on up. And I want to just ground us and just ground our talk tonight with this foundation that the well being of children is inseparable from the well being of the critical adults in their lives. So that old saying of happy wife, happy life, it really is happy family, happy parents, happy children. So you need to put yourself first for right now. We're going to talk about us as parents before we really talk about our children. I love, I'm an Instagram person. I love all the different accounts that I follow. And this is a great one I recommend. This is a wild piece for parents. And it really is full of great inspiration for parents out there. So let's just take stock. You know, why is pandemic life so hard right now? And I wanna name that what we're experiencing are symptoms of stress. So that feeling of feeling all over the place, I feel inconsistent or flaky, like I never forget that and I totally forgot. Um, I tire easily or I have low energy, I'm just so blah. I can't focus. So part of these things are um, poor functioning of your prefrontal cortex, kind of that higher level brain engagement where your executive functioning skills are. Um, they're not firing like they usually are. Um, and so that's due to this stress response that our brain and our bodies are in right now. If you're feeling creatively blocked, whether you take that as your, you know, your creative outlet or just your ability to problem solve novel problems, um, if that feels more challenging, again, a stress response. And if you're sitting there with your family kind of looking into 2021 thinking, I don't know what we're going to do next year. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like. And if you don't really have that motivation to make future plans and goals, again, that's part of that stress response. Your brain thinks it needs to be adaptive right now and kind of be on alert. So it's almost like being in that fight or flight. So I just want to emphasize that all of those feelings are not some failure on your part, that it's not that you're working, not working hard enough or you're not trying hard enough. That is the environment having an impact on your brain and your functioning. So give yourself some grace and accept that this is a stress response, this isn't you. And then I think we just need to name right up front that it's not gonna be like this forever. Um, you might not be firing on all cylinders right now and that's okay. The same goes for your partner, for your best friend, for your children, for your parents. Um, so you need to recognize that it's not going to be like this forever and we can tolerate this in the short term that it's going to be. This is another Instagram account that I love called artbaby.co. They have beautiful graphics like this, so I'll give credit to them. So before we go into any more programming, I really want us to think about ourselves and just to connect with yourself first. If we're going to be talking about the well being of our family, we have to start here. We are really good at monitoring our children's stress, but not so good about monitoring our own. So, not only do you deserve a break, but your brain literally needs breaks to survive. Otherwise, you burn out. So, I want to introduce this idea of microbursts. 
I remember hearing about power napping years ago. I'm not a napper. I'm not a power napper. But people were saying, I can nap for 15 minutes and I wake up and I'm just as energized as after an hour long nap. Um, and experts were saying this was really true. Like this is just as uh, restful and helpful. But so the same concept applies to being able to give yourself a break. As a parent, if you're home with young children, just being able to step outside, take some deep breaths of cold, sharp air, let yourself kind of release whatever stress, anger, uh, explosion that is on that limit, and just take some deep breaths. I say, have a favorite drink. I'm thinking coffee, tea, Diet Coke, whatever it is, um, not alcoholic. Uh, Watch some stupid animal videos, get your joy juice flowing, get yourself laughing, sneak aside and read a couple pages of your book, a quick journal entry, a little jot, um, Sudoku or crossword. It's okay if you're 35 and you feel like a 65 year old woman doing your Sudoku, it's okay. Um, but thinking about taking those small breaks, giving yourself a breather, some downtime, it gives your brain a chance to recuperate so that you avoid burnout. So this is really where I want us to kind of spend some time and think about um, this idea of a healthy mind platter. This image and this concept comes from Dr. Dan Siegel, who is a child development guru, and he is a neuropsychiatrist who has read, written plenty of books. And this comes out of his book called The Yes Brain, which is a great book for parents. Um, but he and Dr. David Rock combined their work and this is out um, to promoting just like the food pyramid, you know, promotes how many proteins and carbs and, you know, veggies and fruits we need to have. What does our brain need to have on a daily basis to be at its best, most optimal functioning so that we are at our best and most optimal functioning. So again, think daily. So just going around this circle, we have sleep time. When we give the brain the rest that it needs, we consolidate all the learning and we recover from the experiences from the day. Our physical time, right? Daily exercise, getting ourselves outside, moving our bodies aerobically, it really strengthens a lot of those connections in our brain as well. And then focus time, you can think about this for adults and for kids. For adults, it can be your work time, it can be any task where you're really goal-oriented and focused. For kids, it's their learning time. Um, but it's where we take on challenges and we really make deep connections within our brain. Then there's playtime. Even adults, even us, we need to allow ourselves to be spontaneous, to be creative, to do some novel problem solving, to kind of open ourselves up to make new connections in the brain. And then connecting time. When we connect with other people, ideally in person, Zoom when you're in a pandemic, um, it just allows us to, again, strengthen those re relational connections within our brain. And also under this one is connecting with the outdoors and connecting with nature. That next one is downtime. When we're not focused, we don't have a specific goal. We can let our mind wander. Um, I like to say the shower, right? We all have 10 minutes in the shower every day where we can just kind of space out. Ideas can come to you. You can kind of think about nothing. Um, and I was talking with a group of parents last night a lot of us think uh, our scrolling on our phone is our downtime. Not if you've watched that new documentary, The Social Dilemma, right? Um, the documentary that talks about the dangerous impact social media has on our lives. And you realize, no, that's really more like junk food. So again, if we're comparing this to the healthy food platter that we need daily, um, scrolling with Instagram and with uh, Facebook and social media really doesn't count as downtime. And that last one there is time in. So think about when do you have time to really reflect internally around your experiences, your sensations, your emotions. And for most of us, that can be um, done through meditating, through mindfulness, or through prayer. Sometimes some gentle practices of yoga really allow that as well. So seven areas that our lives should be pulling from each day. 
I just want you to think, what are the areas that you feel really confident with that are going pretty well for you? So what on there is like, I got that, no problem. And what's an area that could use more attention? And what's an area that you're curious about? Like, what would that be if I had more playtime in my life? What could that look like? What would it be like if I had more time in? So if you're a writer, jot it down. When I talk about that time in, especially to parents, I really think it's a place for growth as parents. Um, and I love this quote, between stimulus, think child, and response, there's space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So Viktor Frankl, uh, he, he was an Austrian Holocaust survivor. He is a, psychi a psychiatrist, a neurologist, and an author. And his most known work was the book, Man's Search for Meaning, based on his experiences in Nazi concentration camps. And Frankl believed that even in the midst of dehumanizing, atrocious conditions, uh, life still had meaning and purpose. So I just want to hold on to that as we think about our family's well-being and trying to counter those feelings of dread, anxiety, and worry, boredom, guilt. And I invite you to think about what is important to you. When we can name what's important and when you believe in and value in in life, you can help your kids be on the same page with you. You can give them a guide for the choices and decisions that they make. So there are many values out in the world. This is just a random sampling, but go ahead and scan these. Feel free to take a screenshot um, and just think about three that really stand out to you. And usually they kind of speak to something real deep that it's a no brainer. You wouldn't have to stretch yourself to say that this was your value. I was thinking after I had already written this, I thought, you know, there's also the value of um, everyone gets what they need. So for those of you that have more than one child, you know that you can do the exact same thing. You can parent the exact same way and get very different results and that different children need different things and that you need something, your husband or your partner needs something and your children need things different. And so for that to be a value that everybody's gonna get what they need. It might not all be the same, but everyone's gonna get what they need. It's gonna take a sip of my tea. Get what I need. Okay. So there was a recent article in the Harvard Business Review and it was talking about problem solving. So in general, my biggest question is why is pandemic life, family life so hard right now? How can I understand the specific issues in my house with my family better. So this article said that a small change in the subject of how you state your problem or the measurement, how you're gonna measure if you're doing better or worse with your problem, it can really lead you in an entirely different direction and give you a whole host of different solutions that would be appropriate for the problem you're trying to solve. So they're saying words matter, how you phrase this matters. So look at the examples below and how there's a different focus in each one. None of them is wrong, but the shift in focus would lead to different solutions or different countermeasures. So number one, our kids are spending too much time on screens. Number two, my partner and I are too exhausted to engage the children. Number three, our family isn't spending enough quality time together. And because of that, we're stressed and arguing more. So if you wanted to focus on the children, you might brainstorm how and when they use screen time and what other activities you're offering. If you wanna focus on you and your partner's exhaustion, you could prioritize self-care to improve overall well-being for the two of you. 
If you wanted to focus on your family's stress and arguing, you could look to add more opportunities for connection as a family. And that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. What a coincidence. Um, so for yourself right now, answer the question, why is pandemic family life so hard in your house right now? And pay attention to who's the subject. And are there other ways you might wanna rephrase that to get at what you wanna see change? And we'll just take a minute here. And I want to remind you that you and your family are unique based on how old your children are, if there's one or two parents in the home, all sorts of factors. And then throw in that we're all experiencing the pandemic differently. So whether that's due to job loss, salary cuts, loss of childcare. So what do you want to address for your family's well-being? So again, our words matter. How we think about things and conceptualize what's wrong really matters. Okay, so as a school psychologist, my job was often, what do we wanna change? Let's measure this, lots of measurement and data recording. So this is kind of my sweet spot. So, we're gonna use my examples from before. If I am going to focus on screen time, first I need to know how much time are they spending on screens now? One hour a day, two hours a day? When I look closely, I may find that during the school week, they're really only spending about 30 minutes on screens because they're so fatigued from all day remote learning. But on the weekend, that's when they're spending maybe three hours between video games and TV. So maybe what I'm going to measure is their weekend screen time. Maybe that's where I want to put my attention in problem solving. What would be acceptable to me? What would be realistic? When I'm looking at number two about my partner and I being so exhausted, what does that look like? I'm falling asleep in front of the TV every night. I'm ordering dinner because I'm too tired to cook. I'm skipping working out in the mornings. I'm putting my children in front of the TV every night because, again, I'm too tired to engage. So that's going to tell me where I want to step in and try to make a change. And then if I'm looking at number three about family quality time, I want to reflect on how and when quality time is happening. Are we eating any meals together? How often? What do those look like? Are people on their phones? Is everybody present? What's a time that's happened? It's happening well, and can we just do some more of it? So I heard this years ago, and I forget who told me, but it was their grandma that said, everything will look different in two weeks. And I have come back to this advice. It's not my grandma, it was someone's grandma's advice. And it's so meaningful because it's true. Whether that's your perspective that is different in two weeks, your familiarity with the problem uh, is different. Um, maybe living with whatever was causing so much anxiety it's not as scary anymore because um, there's less unknowns. If you've had to wait for a COVID test result, you might relate to that. Or maybe it's different because we've just gotten used to this um, new thing. Like if you've ever had to live with a cast, everything will look different in two weeks. So when we know what we're trying to address, I want us to think back on our values. What do we want more of, right? What are we trying to address? When we know that, then where do we wanna put our attention? Because energy flows where the attention goes. You don't wanna to attend to the bad behavior where you're always having to get in an argument with your kid over something. You wanna to attend to when they're doing the right thing and keep putting your attention there. You wanna get everybody on board by problem solving together. Don't try to go changing rules without including your kids in on the discussion. You may know where you want that conversation to land, but you need to invite their input so that you have their buy-in. And then schedule meaningful things into your life, right? 
those things that align with your values. Get on the same page with your partner. Let that be a discussion. And then building routines and rituals around those things that you value. So this is another Instagram account, but this is one I've included in almost all of my presentations this year because I just love, love, love him. It's Charlie McCasey, who is a British artist and author. He has a book that's full of these illustrations. The book is called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. And I included it in here because it really speaks to this piece that's so important, which is recognizing progress. So if you can't see, it says, we aren't getting through, said the boy. Did we get through that last part? Asked the horse. Yes, said the boy. Then we're getting through. So just that reminder to give credence to the successes that you have had. Don't just blow through because you're not at your end goal or that it's still hard. This is an important lesson for us. This is an important lesson for our children to recognize those prop, those signs of progress and to name them out loud to someone, even if it's just ourselves. I'm proud of us. Look at what we did. Look how far we've come. So I want to check in and just review because this is really the foundation of your winter family plan. We talked about those symptoms of stress. It's not you doing a bad job. You're functioning not on all cylinders because your brain is responding to stress. The importance of filling up your own cup first, that that's not a luxury, that's a necessity so that you don't burn out. That healthy mind platter, what should I be thinking of um, that I need to function well in a day? What am I not getting enough of? And then our values, what do we want our actions and our um, activities and our time together rooted in? That naming of the problem, that how you name it kind of matters, right? Who's the subject? Who are you going to work with to change? What are you measuring as the thing that's changing? And then taking time to recognize progress, all of these pieces, so important. So when we talk about making plans, the most important thing to keep in mind is predictability and flexible plans. Children do better when they know what to expect. I would argue that probably all of us do better when we know what to expect and all of us fall on some of the spectrum of rigid to very flexible somewhere. Some of us are a little more rigid, a little more flexible. Children do better when they know what to expect. And then when you're thinking about your daily, um, how you want your day rhythm to be, when you're thinking about your weekend rhythms, um, you have to find a rhythm that works for you. If you're an outdoorsy person, make sure there's time where you all get outdoors. If you are um, a person who likes music, make sure that music is part of that day. Everybody's different. There's no right way. Um, I think that's the downside of Pinterest. If you're a Pinterest person, you're like, ooh, ooh, there's such a great idea and this person made this plan, but it's not yours. So it's not gonna be meaningful to you. A visual timeline or a story can help support everyone's expectations. What is that? It's just kind of writing out a list of what's gonna happen today, even for your youngest person in your house to kind of know that we have breakfast, then we get dressed, then we have playtime, then we have a snack, then we do a little more playtime, then we have lunch, right? There's this rhythm. And so when they say, hey, can I have a snack? You're like, oh, still playtime. You know, might feel kind of arbitrary to you, but to them, it's like, okay, that makes sense. That's just how yesterday was too. Um, I think the other important thing, especially with young children and um, when you're tag teaming with your partner or with any childcare or school that you have is to chunk up your day. My husband and I realized our days had six chunks in them. There was early morning, mid morning, noon, kind of midday, early afternoon, late afternoon, and then bedtime. And there was naps that happened in there. There was meals that happened in those chunks. But we kind of would have to think about 
activities that would fill one chunk, or maybe it was a two chunk activity. Like when we had our child who was obsessed with vacuums and going to apt electronics to look at the vacuums, that could almost be a two chunk activity because you had to drive there, maybe you stopped and got a donut and you looked at vacuums and then you came back. But think about your day in chunks makes it more manageable. You don't want to expect perfection, you give yourself some grace. Maybe one day goes really well and then you try it the next day and it just doesn't go as well. That's life. And then you need to aim to balance the needs of everybody who's involved. Your tasks and your needs, your partners and your children's activities. Everybody, you know, you want no one to get shortchanged, right? So that brings me to something else that's often overlooked. But if you are um, a family with two parents, then there's a parenting partnership that's really important to attend to. Um, and so I often talk to parents, I was just thinking, I often talk to parents about weekends because that's often when people are off work, they're home together, they have ideas of relaxing. Um, and there's a lot of time that has a lot of competing needs and wants. One person might want to uh, watch football all afternoon with their feet up unbothered. Another person might want to do something as a family or uh, go take a walk with a friend. So it's important to check in and to think of those weekends, that's two days, how over this whole weekend are we gonna get our needs met? So ask your partner for what you need. And it's a little bit of a negotiation, but you wanna make sure that kind of that healthy platter that you're supporting each other so that your needs can get met. And it's really a no judgment zone. If someone wants to spend their downtime in a way that you don't think is the greatest, it's really none of your business. They get to do what they need to do so that they can recharge and have that positive well being to bring to the family. Um, but you want to make that game plan together, no judgment. And then you need to verbalize your appreciation when they. Um, kind of if you do a divide and conquer I'll take the kids so that you can do this really verbalizing your appreciation thank you so much for doing that that was really important that I got to do x and then huge for when you are in a parenting partnership is to recognize that both of you are influenced by your different childhoods so you might have a vision of what a father should do based on how your dad acted and if your partner isn't living up to that or is doing it differently, that might really rub you at a level that you might not be conscious of. So I think owning that we have these preset expectations, whether we're conscious of them or not, that we're you know, inlaid into our systems from what we experienced as children. I have mine and my partner has a totally different one. So I, I'm coming back to this because this is a really helpful way to think about planning your children's day as well. So I was talking with a group of parents and one mom said, it's been so great. We've been getting outside super early and no one's at the park, but obviously we're awake because we have a two-year-old and it might be 27 degrees, but we're getting outside. And I thought, oh my gosh, there you go. You got some connecting with the outdoors. You got some physical time. Um, and you built that into your day. So again, another way that this is really useful is when you think about if you have older children for your teens, you know, when your children get older, your relationships shifts and that you're doing more coaching, suggesting um, and advice giving and you're a soundboard for them, but really presenting this to them as, oh my gosh, this is something I learned that has given me a lot of thought. How does this look for you? Have you ever thought about your life and your days like this? What do you feel like you're good at? And inviting that as a conversation with your teenager. And this image is something you can find when you Google it. So feel free to Google it, print it out and put it on your refrigerator. Right, so one of those things when we think about winter is uh, how are we going to get that physical time, especially for our young kids, if we can't get outside. And I think something that needs to be named is we all have a different comfort level with 
how crazy and physical and loud and messy our homes can get. For some of us, it can really cause um, some anxiety or just discomfort, dysregulation even, when our, the noise level goes way up, when the movement and the running gets really ramped up. So think to yourself, how can you kind of compartmentalize some of those activities? Is there a certain place in your house that it's okay to be loud and crazy? Is there a certain time of day where it's not okay to be loud and crazy? And put up some parameters both for yourself and for your family so that everybody's on the same page. And again, that a parent's need for having some more predictable, uh, normal noise level time isn't overlooked. Your needs are important as well. So just some things to think about. I'm sure if I was to talk to all of you and put you, um, take you off mute, you would have great ideas beyond these. But just some things to think about how to get physical um, with your children in your house. Let them be physical. There's those cardboard blocks, the red, yellow, green, and blue blocks. It might bring you back to your own preschool days uh, of being in the classroom and building, but those are such great blocks. They're cardboard, lightweight for children from two all the way up um, because it, they can be used in so many ways. Um, and so as a child develops and grows, they tend to use them more developmentally appropriately. Um, but what most kids like to do with those, we'll just be honest, they want to build them up and then they want to crash through them like the Kool-Aid man. Um, how fun, how powerful that makes us feel. And then you can just build them up again. A trampoline for some kids, this is such a critical piece um, for their systems is to get that hard jumping. Their body just needs a lot of input. If you can't get a trampoline, you can still jump. Um, you can jump outside on the concrete. You can jump outside in the grass. Uh, you can play hopscotch, um, all those kind of jumping games, jumping when you're dancing. But a trampoline, if you have a bar that's also, it's called a safety bar. It is safer to have one of those too. That picture in the middle is just a dad chasing his son, right? Chase is a huge game. Um, if you have a house like mine where you have a loop, you've seen track races go around your house over and over. I think one thing to consider is, again, when is that okay? When is that not okay? Um, are you going to let people wear socks? Socks, people tend to slip and fall. Um, what can you do to make that a little safer if that's a concern? And then the bath, the little ducky just reminds us all that baths don't have to be saved just for bedtime. Baths are a great way to give a toddler age two, you know, through four, up to five. Um, give them that full body sensory experience. You need to be present and monitor but you can be a little tuned out because that is a space where the kid can kind of explore and have that playtime, that open exploring um, novel problem solving with their play. Put the Tupperware in there, put the kitchen uh, tools and spoons, um, strainers, colanders, scoops, all of that. And then a tape cassette, I don't know if people, would we still use tape cassettes? But just to symbolize music and dancing as another way you can build in something to give yourself some physical movement daily. And then we're not excluded from getting outside, right? There's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. Um, the Scandinavian countries, they uh, are outside all year long. Their weather is colder than ours. Um, you know, there's some gift giving, Christmas, Hanukkah that's coming up. Take a look at your family's clothes. Does mom need a pair of snow pants? Does dad need a pair of good snow boots? Um, will we even get snow? Who knows, right? But mittens and neck warmers, hats, warm jackets, fleeces, anything that can keep you able to be outside for you and your children. I want to talk a little bit, we talked about physical time, which really, you know, is one of those pieces on the platter, but rough housing for connection is a way to actually get a twofer. You could get physical time and you could get connection with your kid. Again, when we talk about physical time, um, everybody has a different comfort level with that. Kind of a big generalization would be to say dads and males are kind of more prone to do that rough housing than moms. 
Um, but that's not always necessarily kind of how the line shakes out. Uh, I think you need to kind of check in. How do you feel about rough housing? Do you have um, kind of a safety meter that goes up? Do you have a noise meter that makes you uncomfortable? Um, are you afraid that once you take the cork out, you'll never be able to put the cork back in and you'll just have released crazies? So think about that. And I just wanna talk about some general rules that might help make this um, a little more uh, imaginable that you could imagine doing this with your children. The first thing is to, you need to bring the energy. If you are feeling low energy, it's probably not a good time to do rough house. You know, if you're in that time to make the donuts that does anyone know that old commercial from Dunkin' Donuts? But if you're that kind of, oh, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna feel authentic to you or to your child. But if you can kind of lift it up, you wanna bring that energy. And then you wanna tune into where your child is. Right. If they're at a low energy place, think about the volume knob with all those little notches. If they're at a low energy place, maybe you're going to bring them up a little bit. And if they're way high, maybe you need to tone them down a little bit. How do we do that? We do that with our presence, how big we make our bodies, how small we make our bodies, how loud we make our voices how soft we make our voices, but our prosody, when we talk slower, we calm things down. But when we talk bigger and faster, we're ramping things up. So you really wanna tune in. You don't wanna bulldoze your kid just because you're excited, you're gonna bring them up. You wanna tune into where they are. Earlier in the day is better than later in the day. Rough house before bedtime, it's just a recipe for disaster, right? If you've done it, you know, you wanna do your rough house earlier. No obnoxious tickling. Really, this falls into that idea that kids have consent and say over their own bodies. And we want to be teaching that from an early age. So if we just plow through and we're like, oh, this is tickle, 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 tickle. The kid doesn't really get to learn. Stop. I don't like that. That's too much. And it just kind of, they get bulldozed again. So some kids like tickling, so tickle. But you really, again, want to be tuned in to see how they're responding to that. And then do more of what gets laughs, right? That's the serve and return that we have with our children. I hit my head with a pillow, that gets giggles. And so we giggle together. I hit my head with a pillow again, that gets giggles. I'm gonna keep going because that's a positive connection that we're having back and forth. And then you can be cautious. You can set some ground rules, but you also wanna make it fun, right? You don't wanna suck that fun out. And here's just some pictures, some things to kind of get your ideas turning, right? Good old fashioned airplane. You can do that with your kids for a long time. Um, jumping on the bed, jumping on the couch, jumping off of the couch onto a pile of cushions, all of those things. And then I have a taco. So a taco with a kid is when um, a kid who really likes those deep squeezes that you would roll them up in a heavy blanket or you take a big couch cushion and just kind of push it on them and then release. And then you'd push and squeeze them into that taco. And again, it's that kind of, how much do they like this? How much do they not like this? And they need something different. And then a pizza, May doing a pizza with your kid is a super fun one. Your kid lays down and you massage that dough. So you kind of give them a little massage from head to toe. And then you're going to spread the sauce on it. So you spread the sauce all over their body, get their face, get their toes. And you're going to sprinkle the cheese on them, sprinkling them, sprinkling. And then they get to make up their ingredients that go on the pizza. Do they want worms? Do they want pickles? Do they like pepperoni? Um, and all those things can be put on. And then you're going to bake your pizza. And then you can lift them up if they're small enough and eat your kids up. Right? And what a fun way, how loved you feel, how much good attention you just got from your parent. And if you have multiple kids, you know, it's just an assembly line and then you're gonna go to the next one. But most kids love to be made into a pizza. So here, I just wanna talk a bit about routines and rituals and how they're different, right? So a routine is something that we have to do Whereas a ritual is something that has meaning and purpose. And when we're thinking about having meaningful days, days that um, we come away like, oh, that was a good day um, versus 
it's like, that was a slog. That really was a tough day. Those days are informed by our values and keeping that mind platter in mind, we wanna think how we can use routines and rituals to bring about meaningful acts. So think about your morning coffee or tea. Um, you might have a ritual around that. You might have a special mug that you use. You might have an exact time when that coffee gets made that you come down. You might sit in the same chair. You might read the news or do a crossword, but you have some purpose. So when we think about using rituals and routines to connect, I know some of you might be like, oh my gosh, I don't have any, oh no, I'm a bad parent. It's not true, you do. There's Saturday morning pancakes, there's evening walks, Sunday Zooms with your grandparents, bedtime books, a special song that you sing, right? And if you think, oh my gosh, but we don't do it every Saturday. We don't do it every night, that's okay. That's okay because those times that you do do it are probably pretty impressive on the brain. They make an imprint. And that's the thing is that rituals stay with us. They stay with your child and you get to replay it later as a memory to recapture some of those positive experiences that it provided. Children immerse themselves in the familiarity and the belonging and the expression of rituals. There's a sense of identity that this binds us together. You could put in this house, we da 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 da, right? And say that ritual that you do. It's soothing to children. It's something, right? They like that predictable and expected. And then it's a really powerful way to teach values, what matters. So I just wanna go through um, a ritual that many of us already have which is dinner time, right? However that looks in your house. But you could add to this ritual you have of dinner and just add some intentional dinner time talk. And it's a great way to infuse your values into a ritual and build connection. When you have family friends over for dinner, they get to participate and share in your family ritual. And again, that gives your children a sense of pride. This is what we do at our house gives them a sense of belonging. So just some things, um, there's questions, right? You could read a question a night. That jar is the jar from my house. And if you see at the bottom of that jar, there's like a rubber band, like a bunch of bills. That's all the questions that we already asked. And my boys decided we don't wanna do any question twice so we, they get wrapped up. Um, but questions like, what's a crazy dream you had? What would you do with a hundred dollars? Who is somebody that you've never met that you want to meet, a famous person, right? And you can do this really with your youngest and see how much they can participate all the way up to your teenagers and really let it be a platform to have some of those meaningful uh, conversations where your values can be reinforced and infused. So you could do favorite parts, worst parts. When my son was two, we had a sitter whose name was Kinga. And we would say, what was your favorite part of the day? And he just kind of got it that like, you're supposed to say something. So he would just go, Kinga. And we're like, oh, isn't he cute? Um, but right, so invite those little people to join in. They want to join in. They want to feel that sense of belonging as well. But favorite parts, worst parts is also, I have friends that call it a rose and a thorn, right? And it fights the negativity bias that we're all built to have. And it really makes us slow down and search for something positive in our day. And often at our family dinner, often someone will say, you know what, this is the best part of my day. I've had a real crap day, but right now this feels pretty good. And you realize how important that ritual is. You could share something you're grateful for and bring gratitude into this practice. Or you could name one kind thing someone did for you, which is different than one kind thing you did for somebody because it de-centers yourself, makes your children kind of think about others in their world and to really pay attention and notice how people respond to them. And that if they're really, really thoughtful and they really search for that positive, they can probably find something every day. So for everybody here tonight and who's watching this as a recording, when this gets sent out with the handouts, you'll also get a copy of some dinner time uh, questions for your family. So it's something you just print out and then you cut out the strips and you fold them and you put them into a jar and then you can have 
asking or talk questions too. So that's something from me to you, um, and I hope you enjoy. So cooperation. If cooperation is a value in your house, then you want to comment when you see it in action. So all those words, helping, teamwork, together, no one left behind. Those are the things you're commenting on. That's such good helping. I am so impressed with this teamwork. You guys clean this up together. I'm going to help you put on your shoes because no one gets left behind, right? So always reinforcing this idea that we are together and we're going to get through this together. When you think about games that build cooperation, any kind of child-led game like the floor is lava, fort building, tower building, jigsaw puzzles, word puzzle, those story cards where you're building a story. Germ smack is a simple game my family made up in the pandemic where we just bobble the tennis ball outside and we tried to see how many hits we could get consecutively, right? Something super simple, but that it had to be non-competitive or else it just didn't work um, as a family activity for us. You had someone ending up in tears otherwise. But think about your household rituals and that these also build cooperation. You can ask your children to set the table and each person gets a specific task depending on their age and height and what they can reach. You can pick a time of the week where your family works on their clean tasks together. Everybody can do something, emptying trash cans, sweeping, doing some vacuuming, taking the bed sheets off, right? We're all gonna get through this. So then we can get to the fun thing that we have today. Um, you can find a project that the whole family can collaborate on. Um, for example, making bird or squirrel feeders. And that's in there because I want to share this with you. So this is real snapshots into my life. Um, my son is 13, almost 14. So these are two activities that needed cooperation. The one on the left is something many of you might also be experiencing, which is trying to take the family Christmas photo that's gonna go on your family Christmas card. Um, this is an outtake. And we said to my son, really? Like, is this the face you wanna make? He's like, yes, this is definitely the face I want to make. We're like, oh my gosh, okay, but all right. So it was not what I would have expected or hoped really for cooperation, right? So then a few days later, Again, this ritual that I'd forgotten about of making popcorn strings, I had leftover cranberries. And um, I was like, oh, we're gonna do that. We haven't done that in a few years. I started to do it with my younger son who's very willing and interested. The older one came down and he was like, oh, I, I love this. And he just did it the whole time. We had this very pleasant family time. So I just wanna point out that whether your child is 13 going on 14, whether they're two, anywhere in between into your older teens, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, right? Every day is a chance to try again. And just to mention gratitude, right? We know that gratitude boosts happiness, physical and psychological benefits here. Um, and I just want to talk about a few gratitude rituals and activities that you could incorporate in if this is in line with your values, right? A gratitude scavenger hunt, just Google it. There's so many good ones out there. You could do a task a day. You could find something you're going to bring to dinner and talk about. You could do 20 things in one day and make it a full day activity. Uh, you could do sticky notes on a wall, right? And just kind of let that gratitude build and build and be this visual experience of all the things we've written on there. You could do daily whiteboard jots, right? And then just look at the end of the day, what, what came up today for us? But being intentional, again, to fight that negativity bias, to look for the positive, um, really has some powerful impacts on our overall well-being. And then again, that dinner time share. I have pictures here. We did um, a gratitude pumpkin. We left it out for about two weeks and we just kind of added things to it. And it was a fun way to even share with family and you know people close to us. Like, look, you made it on the gratitude pumpkin. Um, and so I tried to think like, what would be the equivalent for winter time? And I really like, can't really write on a pine cone. I don't know. So you know, if Christmas trees are meaningful to you, that was you could write on strips of paper and kind of build up a tree um, 
of gratitude. Big Life Journal is a great resource. It's a physical journal that you could have. Um, they have one for seven to 10 year olds and then for kind of tween teens. And it's all about gratitude, mindfulness, uh, growth mindset, and has prompts for kids to fill out. And for parents, there's a weekly email and you get on Friday, you get a free printable that has one of those concepts highlighted and can be beneficial for your family. And when we're thinking about gratitude in light of this holiday season and in light of the fact that we're in a pandemic that um, again, we might not have the money, the jobs that we had to really shift people's uh, perspective to what we do have. So as I wrote, wrote this slide, I just wanna draw your attention to um, the picture on the right there. That came up in my Facebook memories from three years ago. So when we're planning for the holidays, we might, like me, have a real vision of what we want that to look like. Um, but especially with the pandemic and things being so different, it's important that we are open to change, right? That it might look really different this year. And to be realistic, maybe a nine-year-old really doesn't want to hang the tinsel for an hour or two, that that's just not their thing. Um, to prep kids for a change in routine, you know, not just like we're not going to have dinner with our grandparents this year at Christmas because of COVID, but a change in your daily routine. You know, if you're going to have a picnic dinner in the car because you're going to drive through the lights and see the Christmas lights in the neighborhood, that needs a little explanation and prep so you don't have a nightmare meltdown in the car when someone's sandwich falls apart. And then I think just to get ready to laugh, this is going to be different this year, right? Look for those moments of humor. Where can we kind of let go and laugh a little bit? And speaking of letting go, where can we let go of our perfection, of our unrealistic expectations? Because again, um, I feel like we get bombarded with these images, right? Of families like laughing and in matching pajamas. But really that just um, inspires comparison and comparison, right? They say it's the thief of joy. Um, it's not real. And just a note on comparison. I just heard this and I thought worth sharing. There are studies about couples satisfactions with their sex lives. And when couples just talk about their own sex life, whether it's the frequency, the quality, the connectedness, their satisfaction rating is typically fairly high. When they compare themselves to other couples though, the satisfaction rating goes way down. So the lesson is just stop comparing and watch out for perfectionism, right? Perfectionism is a defense mechanism. Brene Brown talks a lot about perfectionism. She says it's a faulty belief system that if I look perfect or I act perfect, I can prevent myself from the painful feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. And let's be honest, being a parent, parenting in public, you are ripe for feelings of shame, judgment, and blame, both inwardly to yourself and outwardly to others. So perfectionism is contagious. And it's something you don't want to pass on to your kids. So be aware of when that's bubbling up for you. And remember your boundaries, right? Um, ask for what you need, what um, is going to help you get through, and be sure to ask for those. And for the days when you lose it, because there will be those days, I always say just remember everyone is doing the best that they can with the skills that they have in that moment. And that applies to little Johnny, that applies to your teenager, that applies to yourself, your partner, that applies to your parents. Everyone's doing the best that they can. You need to own up to your mess and repair when needed, right? It takes a little humility, it takes a little practice. I'm sure you'll have lots. And then remember that very few things need to be fixed right now. So if you're afraid, oh my God, my kid is not getting that gratitude is important to us and I'm gonna drill into him that we are a family that expects and demands gratitude, maybe you need to take a step back, dial it back a bit. Maybe that's a conversation you wanna have tomorrow and explore why that activity, that statement came out of his mouth, that activity was so hard, right? You don't need to fix it right now. And then tomorrow is a fresh start. Always, always, always. 
So we've come to the end. Thank you so much for hanging in. And really, I hope that you did feel and get some ideas around supporting your family's well-being, strengthening your connection with your children, and fostering cooperation. And just take a moment, and if you've been a jatter, jotting things down, just take a look at your notes. What's one thing that stood out to you? And then what's one thing that you're going to try? One thing you're like, oh, we could totally do that. I could totally do that. I'm going to try. And then what's one thing that sparked your curiosity that you want to know more about that you might even Google? So I hope that this has been helpful. Again, thank you to the Alliance um, for all their work that they do for families, for children and parents. And I wish you guys a great night. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, thank you for the inspiration and thank you for the very easy to implement strategies. Um, so just to let everyone know, we will be emailing out Molly's slides with those resources uh, once we get the video ready to send out to everyone. So expect that tomorrow. Um, you see Molly's contact information here if you wanna connect with her on a personal level. Like she said, she is a parent coach and she has a treasure trove of resources if you wanna dig in on more of a personal level. So um, thank you so much, Molly, it was wonderful. And um, just a reminder, our next parenting pandemic um, opportunity is on February 18th at 7 p.m. And um, yes, we look forward to continuing to support you and also our educators. Please check our website for other opportunities and other resources. And we look forward to connecting you more this year. All right, everyone have a great night and thank you so much, Molly. Bye-bye.